Aloha, everybody. Thank you for that. And we are in John chapter six. One of the uh, familiar miracles that many people know about and have studied or heard about. Uh, but unique here to this miracle is, and there are a couple, but it is uh, in all four of the gospels. So we call that, when we study that, we call that a harmony of the gospels. And you will see this story repeated, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John but they will offer different insights. For example, John won't mention today that the events of the feeding of the 5,000 uh, came upon his teaching, uh, but the other two of the other gospels will. He used this occasion for some good teaching. Today, we'll just see the miracle itself, but there are other insights from some of the other gospel writers, and that's always good when you're in a Bible study to compare what else is written about it. Let's begin. Uh, we closed off with a big encounter last week in chapter five, and we called it one of the more theological passages in the gospel of John. Uh, Jesus was very clear on who he was and uh, who he is as he was talking to the Jewish leaders. Now he's actually gonna move out of the area of Jerusalem and up into the area of the Sea of Galilee. Actually, where this takes place is, you'll, you'll see John mention an elevated area or a hillside. It's what we would know today as the Golan Heights. So that's kind of where this uh, miracle takes place. You can kind of have the modern day image in your mind, but let's do what uh, scripture loves to do for us. Let's let it teach us. In verse one, it says, after these things, the events of chapter five, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is also known as the Sea of Tiberias, and then a great multitude followed him because of this reason. Now, it's not just a few people. It's not just a multitude. It's a great multitude. But here's the reason they're following Jesus, John tells us. Because they saw his signs, which he performed, on those who were diseased. Now, last week, the, the outstanding miracle was the paralytic of 38 years. And there would have been people that either saw that or the aftermath, but that wasn't the only miracle Jesus did. It's a focus of chapter five. But by this time he had been healing the sick and the diseased. And now people were becoming aware of that. And whether they were sick themselves self or healthy, they were following Jesus wherever he went. And this is some movement now, uh, not just a, a group of five or 10, but by the time this crowd swells, we know it's known as fifth, excuse me, 5,000 men, potential with women and children could be up to 15,000. So to speak of his popularity, you can see that that's not uh, slowing down, it's increasing, but their motivation and their reason is that they saw him heal and perform miracles on those who were diseased. And that struck them to follow him and to seek after him. And verse three tells us, Jesus went up on the mountain and there he sat with his disciples. So he's had a little bit of a journey uh, this mountain is not the mountains that we know, but it's a higher elevated area, slightly, the Golan Heights area. And he is now sitting with his disciples, um, which was the common place for him to teach. He would obviously teach to his own disciples, but his disciples generally have grown, uh, at least in the sense of those who are following, into the thousands now. So back, uh, back the camera up uh, for more of an aerial view on this and just see that setting. The accounts of last uh, week's study, the interaction with the church leaders, the healing and several other healings have taken place. And now Jesus is in this Galilee area above the Sea of Galilee and is sitting with his disciples. There's so many different insights that we learn as this unfolds, uh, the story unfolds, and we'll pop in on, on a few of them. But here's, here's one, and it may explain part of the crowd. 
Now, verse 4 says, The Passover, a feast of the Jews, which we're familiar with, was near. And so with each feast, many people would start, you know, a parade towards Jerusalem. They'd come from these outlining areas. And so that may explain some of the reason that there's some people uh, following him and um, intrigued and interested. But it was that time of the season. It's the Passover, the Feast of the Jews, and it was getting close. It was uh, near. And then Jesus, it says, lifted up his eyes. Remember the picture here? He's sitting with his disciples. And he sees what is now defined as a great multitude, and I like this, coming toward him. Not a violent mob, but they're coming seeking him. He's sitting, resting, teaching his disciples, and he looks out upon the horizon, and he sees maybe uh, off to the left uh, a few hundred at a time, and, and in the center a few hundred more, and, and people behind them, thousands of people, and it says they're coming toward him. They're, they're seeking Jesus because of what they have seen. And they're coming towards him. And watch what he does. Now, remember, as we're watching these events, Jesus is in complete control. He knows what's going to happen. He knows the numbers. Uh, he knows the situation. But he is going to involve the disciples in, in more ways than one. So he's not caught off guard, but he sees what's happening here. And it says that he turns and speaks to Philip upon seeing this multitude coming toward him. He said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? That's a great question, right? I mean, the natural situation, uh, the, the world was different then. There wasn't a local market. Uh, there, there wasn't Ricardo's down the street or Uber Eats that they could just say, hey, we got a big crowd showing up. Can you bring food? Everything had to be planned. And uh, these people are, are first and foremost seeking Jesus. So more than likely, none of them brought lunch. And he sees thousands of people coming and he's testing Philip. Matter of fact, that's what it says. It says, where are we to buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him. That's not a negative test. God doesn't test us for evil. But he's in a constant mode of teaching the disciples. And he wants to see what they'll do. Will they rely on God? Will they freak? Will they uh, break ranks? But he's giving them opportunity. So Jesus looks at it, fully knowing what will happen, fully knowing he's capable to handle the uh, catering issues, but he says to Philip, who, by the way, was kind of the administrator of the group, uh, and he, he is the one that uh, kind of coordinated a little bit, apparently, uh, of the group. And so he says to Philip, what, where shall we buy bread? Something else interesting here in the area where they are uh, is the area where Philip was from. So maybe uh, Jesus is saying, hey, you know the local places. You know the good grinds. You know the good food. Where, where are we going to get enough food to feed all of these people? Sometimes we have to have the problem clarified for us, right? I, I mean, the rest of the disciples see all these people coming. Probably the last thing they're thinking about is feeding them. But Jesus knows they'll be hungry. And what would look to be a problem, and certainly would be of the natural uh, realm, Jesus already has it figured out. Jesus already has the plan, but he's not going to let this opportunity escape without some good lessons. And I think that's what we have to reflect on upon in our life. We have our issues. We have our problems. Uh, we have uh, an opportunity to seek God's help. Sometimes we don't take that and God says, well, you can learn a difficult way or you can learn the easy way by coming to me doesn't mean everything works out perfectly, but he presents it that way to see how they will handle it. Where shall we buy bread that these, these meaning thousands of people may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. And here's Philip's answer, his response. As the administrator, he pulls out his calculator and 
probably assesses the crowd and goes, a few hundred over here and a few hundred over here. Let's see, 200, uh, 200 denarii, he goes, that's about six or seven months uh, of a working salary. So he goes, even if we had, he doesn't say we have it, but even if we had 200 denarii worth of bread, that's not sufficient for them that every one of them may have a little. I and mean, as he's assessing cost and price analysis and the amount of people he's going, even if we had six months worth of wages worth of bread, that wouldn't even be enough to give them a little bit. And that's a good principle because that's the way we think. That's the, the man-sized problems. But God has God-sized answers. And Jesus never intended this multitude. He's going to feed them lunch. But he never intended, intended for them just to have a little. He intends to bless them greatly. Nice that Philip clarifies it though, right? If we were there and Jesus said, hey, Mark, what are you going to do about lunch the, uh, next Sunday? 5,000 people showed up at the coach house. And I look at the hospitality table and I say, we're going to need some blessings from God. We're going to need some help on this. I think that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to say, God, this is a problem. I acknowledge it. Or this is an issue. I don't know how to handle it. Um, what would you do, God? Or how should I respond? Now, remember the disciples of the 12, they've already seen Jesus turn water to wine. They've seen him heal the paralytic and heal many other diseases. So they know he's a miracle worker. Uh, but how easy, even when you're at the feet of Jesus, sitting right next to Jesus, to say, oh, wow, there's no solution here. You're, you're sitting next to the solution person, the God of the universe, and you look at the circumstance and you say, there's no solution. That's kind of how we live our day. We have the option to say, I'm going through a difficulty. Oh, wait a minute. I know the one that works through difficulties. Uh, we have the opportunity to contact other brothers and sisters and say, hey, would you pray for me? I'm going through a difficulty. And, and there is Andrew doing what Andrew does, excuse me, Philip, doing what Philip does. And he goes, man, by my calculations, even if we had the resources, which we don't, and we can't get them, uh, we would just have very little for them. Well, one of his disciples, and here's Andrew, this, uh, this disciple, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to Jesus, and by the way, this is interesting about Andrew. Andrew is the one that keeps bringing people to Jesus. He brought his brother Peter to Jesus. And he finds in the crowd this, that the term is used here, lad. Uh, he finds this little boy. That's really what the term means. It's probably a, a boy in the seven, eight-year-old range. And he, he brings him to Jesus. And there's a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish. Pause there just for a second. Uh, five barley loaves and, and two small fish was apparently what his mother made for his lunch. One mom was thinking and said, uh, you go and you take this lunch with you. But John is the one in his account, the other three don't specify, but he specifies that these are two small fish, uh, probably what we would consider the size of a sardines. So imagine mom that morning before he goes out and says, hey, can I go follow the miracle guy or I'm just gonna go play and get swept up in the crowd. Uh, she's got these two small fish and little loaves of barley bread. Uh, barley bread's not the way that we think of it back then, or excuse me, it's back then it wasn't what we are familiar with. It was a, a poverty type of bread. Uh, most of these people in the region were poor. And so it would be, it would be fed to animals and also used for bread. Um, so it's by no means a luxury. Uh, it's a little bit of a staple, but it was a boy's lunch meant for a, a young boy. And uh, he had it and Andrew finds him and says to Jesus, we've got this lad who has five barley loaves and two small fish. But here's the question, but what are they among so many? So that's, We've heard Philip weigh in. Even if we had the resources, we could only give them a little. Oh, wait, here, Andrew says, is a resource, but what is that among so many? And good question, right? 
I mean, they're at least being honest, these imperfect men. Uh, in this brown bag, if we could use that to illustrate, is a small lunch. But what is that among so many? As long as it is in Andrew's hand or Philip's hand or the little boy's hand, it's not much at all. But when we give it over to God, something great happens. And that's really the case, not only with our resources, but our faith, uh, our words of ourself, trying to figure things out. They, they can be nothing. But when we give them over to God, if we're going into a meeting or we need to encourage someone, God, would you guide me? Would you take my words or would you take my presence or my gift that I'm bringing and put it in your hands to give? Then things change. But they present it. They figured it out and they said, uh, we've got a problem and all we see are two small fish and five barley loaves. Then Jesus speaks. He's involving the disciples. Two of them are uh, mentioned so far, but he's going to involve all of them now. And this is what Jesus instructs the, the disciples. Make the people sit down, which tells you now if, if there's five to 15,000 of them and they're coming toward Jesus and he's more than likely on the hillside here, uh, he, he needs to put some order to the plan. So the first thing Jesus tells them is, you disciples make the people sit down. They're just kind of probably roaming around and standing and maybe you could hear their stomachs growl at this point, whatever it might be. But Jesus said, first thing, everybody just sit down, have them sit down. Now, there was much grass in the place. So the, man, the, the men sat down in number of about 5,000. Is, is the picture coming into focus for you? Here's the shepherd that makes the sheep lie down in green pastures. Uh, the other accounts show the teaching took place. They're seeking him. There's a small meal available, but the shepherd's gonna take care of them. But he's involving his disciples and how he loves to involve us. Instruction again, make the people sit down. There's about 5,000 now sitting on the grass. And notice as we explore these next following verses, there's no thunder from heaven. Uh, it, I, I would equate it to the turning uh, water into wine. You, you didn't know it until after it happened. You just surrender to Jesus as is the case here and we don't even know when the miracle takes place but notice the narrative and Jesus took the loaves that's key they have to be in his hands they have to be given to him he took the loaves and when he had given thanks first God the son takes it and he's very careful to thank the heavenly father even for the smallest insignificant thing of a boy's lunch. Jesus gave thanks. I was uh, eating at a restaurant yesterday uh, for breakfast, uh, Chick-fil-A, because I'm a Christian. Uh, and I, I get a little breakfast sandwich there. It's a tiny little you know, thing. And, um, and uh, I, got a, uh, I got the combo, so you get these little circular uh, hash brown things and sweet tea. I get a half sweet tea and a half regular tea. And I feel like I'm in the South for about five minutes. So. But as I, as I prayed, I, I just kind of simple prayer. I already studied this a few times this week and it came to my mind, you know, maybe I should have ordered a fish filet sandwich instead to be more appropriate. But I, I, I just thought, wow, a simple meal uh, I'm not praying just out of habit. I mean, that's part of it. But I was genuinely thankful for it. And that is what Jesus is demonstrating. He's going to say what might seem the smallest thing. To God, he gives appreciation. To God the Father, he says thank you. And he gives thanks to the Lord. And the disciples are watching. People now in the thousands sitting around and he takes the loaves and when he had given thanks, Jesus distributed them to the disciples. So 
he takes the loaves, he gives thanks, he gives thanks, and then he distributes. And now the disciples are involved again. How did that look? It doesn't explain it. Oh, here's one, here's two, here, put these in your baskets, Pat, you take that group. Here's it, well, wait a minute. There's four, there's five, there's six. I thought we only had five. And they keep coming, and they keep coming, and they keep coming. And not just 10 people, that would be a miracle, right? This one boy's lunch feeds 10 people, hundreds, thousands. And the same thing happens with the fish. He gives thanks, distributes them to the disciples, the disciples uh, to those sitting down and likewise with the fish. And then here is the key, as much as they wanted. Andrew says, even if we had seven months salary of bread, that would only give each a little. But now they're eating by the touch and the thanksgiving of Jesus and the miraculous uh, touch of Jesus. And they're having as much as they wanted to eat. <coughs> what a sign, what a, a picture that must have been. And at, at any point did people say, where is all this bread coming from? Where are all the, did someone just have a, a mother load of fish uh, caught in their boat and bring it up here without us seeing? And, and you don't see any interaction so far here of the people saying, oh my goodness, this is a miracle. It's just happening because it's by the hand of God. I love depending on the hand of God. I love not having, not that I could, but not having to explain the, mir the miraculous touch of God. I'll, I'll never understand that, even when we're with him. Maybe he'll explain that, but this is God. And by giving it over to God, he is miraculously feeding all of these people. And he's got the disciples involved, but not only as much as they wanted, but notice here in verse 12. So when they were filled, most of these people weren't used to being filled because they were poor. And this entire 15,000 or so estimated at times, this entire group, this entire crowd begins to fill up after they're eating. And notice what else Jesus is very purposeful to do. As they're full, everyone's had enough. They're full. He says to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. God won't waste anything. And fragments, the idea of the word here is, is uh, not just crumbs, but it's more like uh, this little piece of bread was left over and uh, this little piece of fish was left over. So you gather up all of that, this miraculous meal from God, after everyone's had enough to eat, they're full, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. Jesus cares about not only involving us, but using the precious gifts and the miraculous touch and not wasting any of it. Utilizing all of it. And so that's what they did. Therefore, verse 13 tells us that they gathered them up and that amount that was left over filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the, the five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. 12 of the idea of these would probably be those large baskets that the fishermen used uh, but 12 large baskets my first thought is oh great each disciple gets a basket <laughs> you know? I don't know what they were used for if they used them to, afterwards for themselves or gave them to some people but nothing is wasted so back up a little bit and see what Jesus has done there's no indication in John's scripture that these people are awestruck they're being, you know, by the miracle, they're being fed and that felt good to have their tummies filled, but the miracle has taken place and God doesn't waste anything in the result. And he has involved the disciples. Verse 14 is a, really our final verse of study here in this brief little catch, but look, look what it says with me. Then these men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, that this would be the men in the multitude, in the crowd. This was their response. And then these men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, which tells us 
they recognize it after it's all over then that it's a miracle. It's a sign. This is their response. This is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. This is truly, we are certain is the idea there, that this is the prophet who is to come into the world. That statement is equal to saying, this one that just fed us lunch is the Messiah. So contrast with me just for a moment to where we left off last week. The same man, God, man, Jesus, miraculously heals a 38 year paralytic or, or paralyzed for 38 years man and the Jewish leaders of the day said to the man you can't be carrying your bed who is it that healed you on the Sabbath and when they confronted Jesus they wanted to kill him for that miracle of healing a man who was paralyzed for these people by the way I, they're both huge miracles, don't misunderstand me. But just for comparison, a man 38 years paralyzed and they wanna kill Jesus and these people have a lunch that fills them full and they call him the Messiah. Now it's not only because of this miraculous feeding, but they had seen him heal others, but God involved the disciples God presented the problem. God put it in his hands. God said, thank you. God distributed it through the disciples and they have full tummies and they say, wow, this is the Messiah. Jesus met a need around the pool and he met another need here on the grassy slopes above the Sea of Galilee and different reactions took place. And one of the key things that comes out of this for us in our application is that our heart attitude towards God, even as believers, in the sense of showing our appreciation or being willing to be used by him, regardless of our resource, a small little lunch, regardless of our resource, really dictates the lessons and the involvement we will have. God, I only have a little but in your hands, it's much. Financially, people tend to focus on big gifts. You know, you walk into some places and you'll see markers on the people who've uh, uh, donated or give, which is fine, you know, wonderful to see how people give. But you know, God is equally concerned with a widow's mite or a young boy's lunch. Doesn't matter how much you make, it doesn't matter how much you give, is God, are you giving it to God? Whatever the percentage is. And don't just think financially. How about our prayer life? God, I'm not a prayer warrior that's on my knees every time. Give me what you have. And I'll involve you more. God, let me stop and pray for that person. Or let me just lift this up to you while I'm thinking about it. And God always says, great, thank you. Give me the little and I'll turn it into much because I want to involve you. And it can be prayer life, it can be financial life, it can be ministry itself. I, I will, uh, I need to remind myself constantly of this. I was with some, my, my uh, friend's elderly parents this week and uh, he lives back on the East Coast. I said, let me just go check in on him. And I spent uh, about four hours with him and it was delightful. I mean, I grew up in their home and uh, when I was in high school, always hanging out there and they're just very dear, dear to me. But I got a little note from them after I left, a little text message. And uh, it was like I brought them uh, a, a, a brand new Cadillac, <laughs> you know? It was like they, they were, it said, we have so appreciated the time and, and uh, it's so great, to, you know, that you take the time to do this and we we're so blessed. And, and, and I thought to myself, that was such a little thing. And it's not because I'm a pastor, I'm a, their friend. Uh, but it was such a little thing for me. But giving over to God is like, they, you, you would think um, I was running for governor, which I'm not. <laughs> you would think that's a guy, Mark, what did you do? And that's what God loves to do. I think those things, oh, you help someone, you open a door, you do. 
see, that, that surprises people sometimes, just being nice. But when we give it to God and say, hey, how would you use my day? I've got a couple extra hours. Or God, carve out these couple hours. It can be money. It can be time. It can be prayer. It can be hospitality. But God just says, hey, do this. Involve me. Put it in my hands. Let's give thanks together. And let me use you in the way that I choose to use you. That sounds like a little bit of a challenge for us, doesn't it? It is. As you go out this week, what little do you have to offer? Don't worry about the numbers. What little do you have to offer? Just give it to God and see what he does with it. This is a significant change. In, well, not a significant change. This is now a, a, a different approach now because now we're not just dealing with 12 or a few people that saw miracles on the journey, but now 15,000 people estimated have witnessed this. And so Jesus, in chapter 6, Jesus' popularity is just going to continue to grow. And some will come for the wrong reasons. Some will we'll see. Some will show up at future events and say, I wonder if they're passing out fish sandwiches today. I wonder if Jesus is doing that miracle today. And others will come because they're truly seeking Jesus. But don't miss what's been stated through this act. This is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. Your sacrifice, your small gift, and however that goes out to your family, friends, or whatever, can lead some people to inquire more about God. And it can even lead to you presenting people the gospel. Let's pray as we close. And as we do, we'll take a moment as we typically do then we'll sing that chorus again, turn your eyes upon Jesus. But while you sit quietly before the Lord, would you ask him one question? That is, what is the small gift that I can give into your hands? Maybe, maybe he'll point out several things, maybe a person, but just sit silently before him as we close and ask him what that is. And if he points it out to you sitting here, it's a note, it's an email, it's a text, it's a call, it's whatever it is. Then you just tell him, here it is, God, I give it to you. And we'll see how God uses it this week. Let's take a few moments before it. For those of us who sometimes think, oh, what I have is insignificant, doesn't even really seem like a gift, hear us as we turn that over to you. If you're putting a specific person or some different people in our minds right now that might just need encouragement, a hand up, a helpful touch, let us give that to you. And as you've modeled before us, Lord, as we do, let us give thanks for what we have been given at any level and turn it over to your hands to watch what you want to do with it. With that in mind, I want to thank you for involving us. This is your church. We will be giving out gifts this week as a body of believers directed by you and we'll give you all the honor for also, just as we get that vision again of thousands of people coming towards you on that hillside, Jesus, let us be part of that crowd. Let us be those who seek you, that look for you, that turn our eyes upon you. As we watch this world go through a very difficult week, it could bring us down. But each time we come to you, each time we look to you, the world grows strangely dim with all of our problems. You have the answers. You will take us home 
you will bring us right to your side and this world will be done. So help us to keep focused in the right direction. Let's sing that song slowly again as we were singing earlier. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim. In the light of his glory and grace. Ladies, would you sing that? Turn And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his. 